is, you know, piecemeal as people are doing other things. So. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, please, please let us know in the chat where you're tuning in from. Um, I'm thrilled to be in attendance at this virtual book talk of the United States, Southeast Asia and historical memory. My name is Danae, and I'm the Chief of Mission Advancement and Communications at Legacies of War. I'm also the staff liaison uh, for the Legacies Library Committee. For those of you that don't know, Legacies of War is an education and advocacy organization working to address the impact of the American secret war and conflict in Southeast Asia, including removal of unexploded ordnance, UXO. We raise awareness about the history of the secret war. Bombing of Laos provides space for healing uh, the wounds of war and create greater hope for the future of peace. Legacies Library, is a collection of books, films, articles, and oral histories vetted by Legacies of War that tell the story of the American bombing of Laos and its neighbors in Vietnam and Cambodia. Legacies Library offers original programming, including film screenings and author interviews like tonight that tell a living story of the secret war in Laos, ensuring that it's no longer a footnote in American history. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, uh, Jessica Pierce Rotendi. Jessica is the trustee of Legacies of War and the co-chair of Legacies Library. She's a journalist and the author of a book about her family's involvement in the US bombing of Laos, What We Inherit, A Secret War and a Family's Search for Answers. Her work has been featured in the Boston Globe, CNN, NBC, The History Channel, Reader's Digest, Salon, and Vogue. So welcome, Jessica. Welcome, everybody. Um, Jessica, thank you for moderating, moderating this discussion. Thank you for that great introduction, Danae, and welcome to everyone in our audience here. Thank you for coming out on a Thursday night to celebrate a book that is so worth celebrating. We're really grateful to all be together this evening, at least virtually. I also want to thank our sponsors, the Sigur Center for Asian Studies at the George Washington University, 
and Partnerships for International Strategies in Asia, or PISA, at the Elliott School of International Affairs. Um, thank you for co-sponsoring us along with Legacies of War. And before we forget, begin tonight, I really want to take a moment to honor one of our co-authors who could not be here tonight. Uh, Nyo Vinh Long, a titan of Vietnamese studies, passed away just yesterday. He was supposed to be here with us tonight. Um, we're just having him so much in our thoughts at this moment. We know that um, he would have wanted us to go on. His scholarship and his activism on behalf of those impacted by the war in Vietnam have touched so many. Um, so through everything that he's done and through this book, which holds some of his very powerful words, we hope to continue his legacy tonight. I'll let the other panelists um, speak and share their memories of him as well. Um, but first, I want to give them all a warm welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, to Nyet, Elaine, Mark, Ben. I'm going to read a brief bio for all of our speakers here tonight and then turn it over to the book's editor, Mark, um, to allow him to say a few words before we begin the evening. And of course, at the end of our discussion, around the 10 minutes to nine mark, we'll invite everyone to um, ask their questions via Facebook. So please type your questions in the comments. I'll be reading them to our panelists throughout and we'll get you a conversation going. So. Here we are, without further ado, I'm gonna start with Elaine Russell. Welcome, Elaine. Elaine is the author of fiction for adults and children, as well as nonfiction works. She first traveled to Laos in 2006 to research her beautiful novel, Across the Mekong River, the story of a Hmong family fleeing Laos after the Vietnam era civil war. On this trip, she learned about the terrible tragedy of unexploded ordnance or UXO, remaining from US bombing campaigns in Laos during Vietnam. These weapons continued to kill and injure people 50 years later. On returning home, Elaine connected with the US-based nonprofit Legacies of War, which works to raise awareness and increase funding for UXO clearance. She volunteered with us, assisting at many, many of our events throughout the United States and served on our board for five years. She traveled with us to Laos in 2008 and 2010, thank you, Elaine, and remains an ardent supporter of the group's important mission. She's actually written two essays on the Civil War in Laos and its aftermath. The first, Legacies of War, Cluster Bombs in Laos, was co-authored with Chanapa Kamswangza, uh, previously director of Legacies of War. And the article was first published in the Critical Asian Studies Journal in June of 2009. It has since been updated to reflect current information on the situation and the progress made, which is so encouraging, um, in the UXO clearance in Laos. Um, this article is included in our book we're discussing tonight, The United States, Southeast Asia, and Historical Memory. Her second essay, Living with Unexploded Ordnance, Past Memories and Present Realities in Laos, was published in Interactions with a Violent Past, Reading Post-Conflict Landscapes in Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, which was edited by Vatana Falsena and Oliver Tapp. Thank you, Elaine. Now a little bit about Mark, our editor of this wonderful book. Mark is an independent editor. He was active in the U.S. movement against the Indochina Wars in both volunteer work and with the Indochina Mobile Education Project and the Indochina Resource Center in Washington, D.C., where he's joining us this evening. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Nguyen Nguyen, uh, Professor Nguyen was born and raised in Vietnam. She completed her MA at the University of Oregon on a Fulbright scholarship, obtained her PhD at American University in 2019, and is currently working on a book on the transnational anti-war movement by the Vietnamese during the war with the US. She has been active in shedding light on the GI anti-war movement and in projects to help clear unexported ordinance in Vietnam. The professor is now teaching at the University of Alaska Southeast as an Asian assistant professor of history, and she very kindly is standing in for long tonight. So thank you so much for being here with us. Um, and last but not least, Ben Kiernan. Ben, thank you for being with us tonight. Ben is the A. Whitney Griswold Professor Emeritus of History at Yale University. He was founding director of the Cambodian Genocide Program from 94 to 99, and of the Genocide Studies Program from 1998 to 2015. And he was chair of Yale's Council on Southeast Asia Studies from 2010 to 2015. Of his many books, um, they include How Pol Pot Came to Power, 1985, The Pol Pot Regime, 1996, Genocide and Resistance in Southeast Asia, Blood and Soil, A World History of Genocide and Extermination from Sparta to Darfur, and Vietnam, A History from Earliest Times to the Present. His work has appeared in 14 languages. 
It is featured in Southeast Asia, Essential Readings, and in 50 Key Thinkers of the Holocaust and Genocide. A little bit more about his books, Blood and Soil won the Independent Publishers 2008 Gold Medal for the Best Work of History, and the 2009 Sybil Halpern Milton Memorial Book Prize for the Best Book Dealing with the Holocaust in its Broadest Context. Its German translation was Nonfiction Book of the Month, and in 2002, he received a Critical Asian Studies Prize for his anthology Conflict and Change in Cambodia, and a 2018 Inspiring Yale Award in the Yale School of Graduate Studies. For three decades, Kiernan has documented the crimes of the Khmer Rouge regime, and under his direction, Yale's Cambodian Genocide Program established the Documentation Center of Cambodia, uncovered the archives of the Khmer Rouge secret police, detailed the case for an international tribunal, and won multiple awards. So with that introduction to all of our speakers tonight, I'm gonna to hand it over to Mark, the editor of the book, to tell you more about how it came to be and a little bit more about why we're all gathered tonight. Over to you, Mark. Uh, can you hear me okay? Am I, do I have my mic? Okay. I, I'll, in addition to echoing the thanks for all of the sponsors of this event. I want to also specially thank the co-editor of this book, Carolyn Luft at Haymarket Books. Uh, Carolyn contributed substantively to the content of this book in every way. She was not a, you know, sort of mirror uh, copy editor or, or anything like that. Uh, Carolyn is a progressive person and was an enormous help in putting the book together. So I want to say thanks to her. Um, I want to mention an epigram, which I think is important for the uncomfortable topics that we have to discuss tonight. In uh, and It's the epigram that Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman used for their classic, classic work, um, The Political Economy of Human Rights. It's a quote from an essay of George Orwell's for, uh, written in 1945. The essay was Notes on Nationalism. Orwell said, the nationalist not only does not disapprove of atrocities committed by his own side, but he has a remarkable capacity for not even hearing about them. And I think that uh, pertains to a lot of what we have to discuss tonight. Uh, I, I don't even have time to give you all of the, uh, you know, even a, a modest uh, summary of the credentials of all of the contributors to this book, let alone all of the content. So this is going to be a very rapid overview of the contents of the book, but I, I think it's important and, and I do want people to read it. Uh, Richard Falk, uh, disting, distinguished emeritus professor of international law at Princeton with affiliations at many other universities, recently a uh, special rapporteur for Palestine at the United Nations, kindly wrote the introduction for our book. He put all of the events described in, in all of the articles, which I'll tell you about, into the context of international law, as we know it since the Nuremberg trials and the United Nations Charter. And it's a very eloquent introduction and I'm very grateful to him for having written it. Um, the first chapter in the book is War Crimes in Indochina and Our Troubled National Soul by the activists and uh, with a specialty in on Laos, Fred Branfman, who I worked with at the Indochina Resource Center. Uh, when I first read this essay of Fred's on how should it really a question of historical memory? How should Americans think about uh, the events of the US intervention in Indo Indochina? Years ago, when I first read it, I thought it was, you know, Fred at his most idealistic and uh, very noble. But uh, what, uh, what chance of realization? I, I didn't know what to think about that. But I, I want to say something positive tonight. I think uh, Fred's call for recognition, apology, and the making of amends is actually a realistic goal. Uh, we are all aware of truth and reconciliation committees that have achieved significant things in South Africa, in Argentina, 
in Chile and, uh, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, another example I want to give uh, in this vein, there's a recent book by an American philosopher, Susan Niemann, who works in Germany. So she has a book about Germany titled Learning from the Germans. And she's talking about how German education, uh, sorry about that, German education has, has uh, absorbed the, the lessons of the Second World War. And every young German learns about all of this and is knowledgeable about it. And uh, therefore, racism and anti Semitism, you know, we can't say they've vanished, but they, they've so greatly abated. And, and it's, it's considered so disgusting to voice anti-Semitic or racist, racist sentiments in Germany. Uh, it's a positive example. I think we could do the same thing for Indochina and this country. Uh, I mean, different events, but still, uh, there's a need for it. I think Fred was right. So that's his piece. You have to read it for yourself. <laughs> Uh, the second piece in the book is an excerpt from Fred's book, Voices from the Plain of Jars. Uh, Fred also worked as an interpreter in Laos with several important journalists. Uh, while doing this work, he encountered uh, refugees from American bombing in northern Laos. Some of these refugees had, had drawings with them of what was going on, you know, in this unreported area of uh, northern Laos. And uh, Fred, they were images of the destruction caused by American bombing. Fred collected these images into a book, which is still available from the University of Wisconsin. And uh, of course, very poignant and moving. So I, I think you should look at that too. The third chapter in the book is by Chanapa Kombongsa, founder of Legacies, and Elaine Russell, who's here with us tonight. And it's a uh, outstanding, summary of Laotian history, including its long history of foreign interventions, and most recently that of the US, and the legacy of the US, of US interventions. And I'll leave uh, Elaine to speak more about her own piece. The fourth piece in our book is uh, Agent Orange in Vietnam by the uh, medical researcher, Australian medical researcher, Tuan Nguyen, and it's an encyclopedic collection of information about all of the damage caused by the enormous use of dioxin and Agent Orange in mostly in Southern Vietnam and the continuing damage that it's doing. Uh, you know, everyday birth defects, everyday uh, cancers being discovered. Uh, we're lucky to have this article in, in my opinion. Uh, the fifth article in the book is by Ben Kiernan and Taylor Owen. Taylor Owen is Ben's co colleague, a Canadian uh, political scientist. It's a, 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 a brief examination of Cam recent Cambodian history. But in addition to history, Ben and uh, Taylor worked um, Freedom of Information Act requests very vigorously with the end result that they discovered that the real amount of US bombing of Cambodia, an Asian country the size of Oklahoma, was something like 6 million tons of bombs over nine years. And uh, of course, Ben will speak uh, at greater length about the conclusions they drew, but it's, it's a remarkable piece. Uh, the sixth piece in the book is Me Lai and the American Way of War Crimes by the Asia scholar Gareth Porter, former co-director of the Indochina Research Center. Uh, Gareth demonstrates and did numerous interviews for this piece. Uh, the My Lai massacre was covered up and no one ever, ultimately was ever punished for it, except lower level uh, people, individuals involved, the, the grunts of the war. Uh, all the higher ups escaped punishment much of that was uh, bureaucratic uh, machinations, and uh, there was also a lot of self-interest and careerism involved, as you might imagine. The seventh piece in the book is uh, The Indonesian Domino by the Australian political scientist Clinton Fernandez. So Indonesia 
American planners always looked at Southeast Asia as a whole. It was not a question of looking at tiny Laos or, or any other individual country. It was always the region, region as a whole. And they were always uh, focused uh, very high in their priorities was Indonesia. Uh, it's, it's of a piece with American planning that in 1965, uh, populist, a populist movement under the uh, democratically elected leader Sukarno was reaching a scale that upset US planners very much. They did not want Indonesia asserting itself and taking control of its own destiny. So the CIA and American planners engineered a mass murder of something like half a million people. And uh, Robert McNamara described this as a success story. And the New York Times uh, wrote an editorial about it. They described the massacre as, quote, a gleam of light in Asia. And, you know, you it's a very worthwhile piece. Uh, the eighth piece in the book is Nick Terse, uh, by Nick Terse, an American journalist. Uh, the title of the piece is a quote from a peasant, so many people died. It's an excerpt from his book titled, Kill Everything That Moves, which is basically a book about counterinsurgency doctrine in South Vietnam seen from the ground level. Uh, Nick did extensive, uh, first person research in South Vietnam and compiled uh, a raft of uh, horror stories, basically. And his book uh, very, itself very worthwhile, his chapter is very worthwhile. The ninth piece in the book is uh, an excerpt from Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman's The Political Economy of Human Rights. It's the section on Vietnam, which is titled Bloodbaths in Indochina. I can't uh, summarize this piece here. Uh, it, there's so much factual detail in it, uh, but uh, reiterating themes from Richard Falk's introduction and from the Nuremberg trials, I th think it's fair to say the overall point is aggressive war is the supreme international crime as uh, Robert Jackson put it at Nuremberg. If you accept aggressive war, Everything that follows is 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 a is to be expected. So, there were massive war crimes in South Vietnam, and uh, they resulted from counter counterinsurgency doctrine and the general uh, policy goal of imposing U.S. Uh, order on uh, a population that wanted to be independent and free. Uh, there's a the tenth piece in the book is a short piece again by Noam Chomsky, which first appeared in a small journal edited by Neil Van Long. This piece is titled From Mad Jack to Mad Henry. It's, I think, the best single short article about the history of foreign intervention in Vietnam. And I'll leave it at that. The 11th piece in the book is by Noam Van Long, who I did meet and work with and uh, knew and he wrote this piece specially for our book. It details the history of Vietnam from 1975 through the later 90s and goes into detail about US economic warfare against this country that had just suffered so much. Long gives uh, the, the US economic blockade that was implemented, implemented by Kissinger. Uh, Long gives estimates of uh, 2 million war dead 2 million wounded and over 2 million victims of chemical warfare. It turns out that uh, the National Academy of Sciences did further research on the uh, effects of Agent Orange in Vietnam and found that those numbers were an underestimate. There were many more millions of people in Vietnam who were exposed to chemical warfare and who are with continuing effects through today. Uh, it's a great piece by our late colleague Long. Uh, the 11th piece in the book is, uh, I'm, wait, that was the 11th piece. How did I do this? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, what the, the two remaining pieces in the book are interviews with 
Fred Branfman and uh, Noam Chomsky. Both of them speak at length in these interviews about the reasons for their involvement in the US anti-war movement, general questions about uh, the United States and uh, the role of propaganda, the role of intellectuals, all of these topics that were, we, uh, they're both famous for discussing. Uh, there's also at the end of the book, there are in bibliographies for each article. In addition to those bibliographies, there are general bibliographies from people who didn't otherwise contribute to the book. And I want to single out uh, Marjorie Cohen, a professor of, interna of international law and of human rights law at uh, UC, Sanda San UC Davis. And so a tremendous bibliography on human rights law. And uh, there's also a list of organizations currently doing aid work in the countries that we've discussed. And uh, thank you very much. That's, I know I ran over. No, thank you so much for that introduction, Mark, and that overview of all the rich um, stories that span continents, really, in this text. I'm next going to turn over to Elaine Russell to tell us more about what happened in Laos. Elaine. Um, the paper that's in this book was one that was written quite a few years ago, but then updated. Uh, I had joined Legacies of War in 2006 when it was still a pretty new organization and we were still trying to figure out exactly where we were going and what we wanted to focus on. And, and a major part of that was to help educate the public about what had happened in Laos and the US secret war and the bombing, because it was a subject that virtually most people in the United States didn't know about, hadn't paid any attention to. They had no idea <clears throat> of the vast number of unexploded bombs that still remained in Laos. So we decided that it would be good to try to put together a paper that would summarize the situation and look at all of the consequences that that had brought. And so um, we <clears throat> first finished this paper and it was in the uh, journal Critical Asian Studies in 2009. And after that, we actually updated it several times. <laughs> and, Mark kept uh, asking us to update it again, <laughs> and we did. But um, it's it's nice to see that we have made a lot of progress since that first initial paper was published. Uh, so one of our goals was simply to summarize what had happened, give a little history of Laos and where, where things had been before we got to the Vietnam War and to the Civil War in Laos, that was part of that. And uh, we wanted to provide not only just to talk about the bombs and the ongoing problem of accidents and killing and maiming people constantly, but also the wider uh, ramifications that that meant for Laos and in, in their economy and their health care and their, you know, ability to provide basic services to people that helped um, continue to make it a very poor country where people had very little. So um, we began our research and I, I actually had been reading quite a few books on the war in, in Vietnam and or in Laos as part of my novel that I was working on. And what was remarkable was that there was really virtually nothing about these, the secret war and the bombing and the, the leftover unexploded ordinance in these history books because so little was known about it and there was so little data and we hadn't begun to see how this was continuing to plague the people in Laos with these, these accidents. And so, um, we tried to start gathering what data was available and found that there was, there was not a great deal, that um, a few people had tried to put together information. Um, some of the organizations that went to work in Laos, uh, like Handicap International 
and um, um, I'm going blank here. Uh, the other major study was oh by by um, the the landmine monitor reports that were published each year, which also tried to include the um, cluster bombs and other unexploded ordnance that was taken out of Laos. So there there wasn't even a real effort to remove or clear the unexploded um, ordnance until the 1990s. Um, originally, after the war, the Russian government was there, or the Russian military was in Laos, and they were doing some clearance, but it was very haphazard. There was nothing organized. And a lot of people were dying at that point. Farmers were going back to their land, trying to farm, and instead finding all of these cluster bombs and even great big bombs that were unexploded as well. And so a lot of people were being killed at that point, but there was no data on any of this. The government was so overwhelmed with everything that they, they really didn't keep track of what was going on. And so in the 1990s, finally, with some help from um, some of the organizations that were working there, nonprofits that were working there, they began organizing some efforts to, for clearance. And Mines Advisory Group was one of the first groups in there. And then other countries began funding some of it and providing um, these services as well. So um, there were some early studies, but they didn't really um, have a strong base for the data or the conclusions they were reaching because it just simply wasn't available. And the US military, even though in, um, back in 1971 at some Senate hearings, they did provide information on the bombing and the number of bombing sorties and all of that, there was um, not any information about exactly where they, where they occurred within the country. And it wasn't until 2000 that that um, information was, the strike data was released and was declassified. And so then it was, it was um, possible to at least identify the he most heavily contaminated areas. So we tried to take all of what was available and put it together and reach some conclusions. And one of our hopes was that there would be some reconciliation between the US and Laos and also from the Lao diaspora and the people that were in the country that would help to start really um, stepping up the level of clearance and helping, helping Laos to get past this. So, we went to Laos in 2008, and um, that was a really wonderful trip <laughs> in which we were able to meet with all kinds of organizations that were working there. And we learned so much more about what was needed and what was going on and, and all of the obstacles and problems that were being encountered. And so all of that went into our initial paper and um, we hoped, and, and really through that paper, we did reach a lot of people that contacted us and were interested and it, it helped a great deal. And then um, <coughs> since then, there has luckily been lots of progress. And um, for one, there was the National Regulatory Authority of Laos, which oversees all of the uh, UXO clearance had published a paper on, um, it was a survey of all of the um, accidents and injuries and deaths that were related to UXO, so that there was some concrete data to work from. And then um, the other organizations, nonprofits that were working there contributed a lot as well. So um, since then, there's been a steady increase in funding from the US, which is great because they started out at practically nothing, <laughs> contributing very little. And uh, we, I think Legacies um, was very successful in bringing a lot of attention to the issue in Congress and then with the state, um, with the department 
of state and their or their group that works with these countries in the, the problem of UXO. And so, <coughs> excuse me, um, funding was increased substantially and kind of culminated in 2016 when President Obama actually went to Laos and pledged a large amount of money over three years, which really helped. And then since then, it's even gone up more. I, I think it was 40,000 this last year, but I think somebody from Legacies would have to <laughs> sit, tell us. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's encouraging that things are getting better. They're doing lots of um, more planning and using the data more carefully and, and uh, so I'm glad that we were able to update this and put it in the book. It'll, it's an ongoing process. <laughs> so that's, that's it. Great, thank you so much, Elaine. And anyone wanting to learn more about her trip to Laos, we were lucky enough to have Elaine as a guest on the Kip Dao podcast, <laughs> um, which is run by Legacies of War, where she describes in detail the really horrifying things she saw, but also her reasons for hope. Um, in Laos. And Elaine, I also want to quickly point out, I so related to not finding information or primary resources even on the secret war in Laos. It spent 10 years um, looking at declassified documents for my own book. And it's one of the reasons we founded the Legacies Library, which features all of your books prominently, um, mm -hmm. but also all books about the secret war in Laos um, and in Vietnam and Cambodia. There is such um, a richness of resources being published, especially in the last five years, as more information comes out, as more is declassified. So we're in an exciting time for scholarship mm -hmm. and for those looking to reckon with their own family's past or just the past <clears throat> the United States of America that's often not found in history books. Um, and with that, I want to turn it over to Wit to talk about Vietnam and what we can learn from her there. Thank you, Nguyen. Oh, well, thank you, Jessica. I thought I was going to go after Ben. So. I'm so sorry. You're absolutely right. I actually, would you like yeah. to go after Ben or would you like to go? Yes, on? yes. Let's just go. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. I meant to introduce Ben Kiernan, whose work in Cambodia has spanned the last decade and who uncovered a lot of really um, horrifying, but again, um, call to action type of data that I'd love to speak to directly. So here you go, Ben. Sorry about that again. Thank you, Ingrid. That's very generous of you. Um, I would like to just make a special uh, tribute to uh, Novin Long, who we lost in the last couple of days. He was a very fine scholar, a historian of Vietnam, and he was a great human being. I think I knew him for close on 40 years, and uh, he was uh, the author of uh, the book um, Before the Revolution, uh, The Vietnamese Peasants Under the French, which I think is still the best work on that. It was published by MIT Press in 1973 and reissued in 1991 by Columbia University Press. It's a great book on the history of Indochina under French colonialism. And he's also the uh, co-editor with Douglas Allen of a book called Coming to Terms on the United States and Indochina after the war. Two very fine works. And he's also the author of a lot of articles, uh, particularly about French colonialism in Indochina and the US uh, role in Vietnam and uh, the reconciliation uh, of Vietnam and the United States after the war. He was a Vietnamese Democrat of the finest sort. Uh, this chapter five in the book, The United States, Southeast Asia and Historical Memory uh, was co-authored by Taylor Owen and myself, a Canadian historian. Taylor Owen uh, was uh, uh, the author with me of uh, several articles on the US bombing of Cambodia. This was the most recent one. Uh, and we worked together on this project uh, to try to work out what was the legacy of the US war in Cambodia. And we started the chapter by looking at also the legacy of the US war in Iraq. Uh, and uh, interestingly, these are two eight year wars from Cambodia. Uh, in Cambodia, it was from 1965 to 1973 when the US ceased its bombing of Cambodia and in Iraq from 2003 to 2011. And one of the legacies of the US bombing of Cambodia 
was the rise of the Khmer Rouge in that period led by Pol Pot. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later, but they were able to rise uh, from the ashes of the US bombing of Cambodia and eventually in 1975, take over the country and uh, subject it to two genocides and multiple crimes against humanity. In the case of Iraq, another eight year war in which that country was subjected to uh, massive US bombing. Uh, what we saw uh, in that uh, period was the rise of Al Qaeda and the Islamic State organization. Uh, again, two other uh, organizational uh, powers that uh, again committed genocide, particularly against the Yazidi population of Iraq. So we start off with that particular parallel in the uh, with the with the Cambodian case. Uh, the bombing of Cambodia was much greater, however, than in the case of Iraq. I just want to uh, mention that six million ton, tons of bombs that Mark mentioned, that refers to the total US bombing of all of Indochina during the US wars in uh, over Laos and Vietnam, North and South, and Cambodia. Uh, the uh, total uh, of US bombing of Cambodia in terms of tonnage uh, was at least 539,000 tons. Now, if we compare that to the US bombing of Japan during World War II, the total there was 160,000 tons. If we compare that to the US bombing of Korea during the Korean War, the total was 454,000 tons compared to 600,000, sorry, 6 million tons in Indochina and 539,000 tons, perhaps more in Cambodia. Uh, now we found out that there is another parallel as well as the one between Cambodia and Iraq uh, that was released, uh, was uh, discovered when uh, the texts of telephone conversations uh, between President Nixon and his then uh, security, National Security Advisor, later Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, were um, released under the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, this was during the uh, bombing of Cambodia. President Nixon wanted to extend and intensify the bombing of Cambodia. And he told uh, Henry Kissinger on December 9th, 1970, uh, that the US Air Force is being, quote, unimaginative in its bombing of Cambodia. He demanded more bombing deeper into the country. Quote, they have got to go in there, and I mean really go in, he told Kissinger. I want everything that can fly to go in there and crack the hell out of them. There is no limitation on mileage, and there is no limitation on budget. Is that clear? Nixon said to Kissinger. So five minutes later, Kissinger called General Alexander Haig to relay the new orders. And we describe this in our chapter five in the book. Quote, he, that's Nixon, wants a massive bombing campaign in Cambodia. This was after uh, six years of bombing that had already taken place. He doesn't want to hear anything, Kissinger continued. It's an order, it's to be done. Anything that flies on anything that moves. You got that? Kissinger said. Now, uh, as you'll read in the chapter by Gareth Porter in the same book, uh, this brings up the question of uh, the statement by Ernest Medina just before the My Lai massacre, when he said to his troops in anticipation of the massacre, kill everything that moves. And Porter also mentions the Tiger Force unit of the 101st Airborne, the rampage that they went on in central Vietnam, uh, in which they were they are quoted uh, as being ordered to kill everything that moves. A similar language is being used by Henry Kissinger, relaying President Nixon's orders to uh, the Air Force to bomb Cambodia. And this is, of course, the title of Nick Terse's book, Kill Everything That Moves. And he also has a chapter in this book giving more details about that. Now, this information about what happened to Cambodia under the bombing uh, has been released slowly over 
over the years. That uh, quote from Nixon and the, the telephone conversation with Kissinger and Haig uh, was released about uh, 10 years ago, as I recall. Um, the uh, number of sorties, however, only came out in uh, 19, 2000 when the Clinton administration released to the countries of Indochina uh, the Pentagon database, which contained information about the number of sorties and where the bombings had taken place and the targets of those bombings and what the Pentagon and the Air Force believed they were bombing when they released the, the payloads of their airplanes. And one of the most important things about the database, uh, which has uh, a number of errors about the tonnage but it, one of the most important things is the targets. What were the targets that the Air Force and the pilots and the crews thought they were bombing? Well, in the first four years from 1965 to 1969, 83 sites were bombed by US tactical aircraft in the late 60s, where the target was recorded as unknown or unidentified. A thousand tons of bombs were dropped on what the pilots and the Air Force did not know what they were bombing. And then in 1970, after Lon Nol had overthrown Prince Sihanouk and brought Cambodia directly into the war, uh, 573 sorties were uh, dropped bombs on unknown or unidentified targets. 5,602 places were bombed where no target was entered into the database. There was no target for 5,600 uh, bombing raids. Uh, in 1971, uh, another 182 places that were uh, unknown targets, uh, 19, uh, and, and uh, 1,390 unidentified targets. This went up in 72 to 1,500 targets that were unknown or no target recorded. And then in 1973, the height of the bombing, 2,632 places were bombed and the target was recorded as unknown. And another 465 where no target was recorded. So in all from 1970 to 73, when the war spread across Cambodia, 114,000 sites were bombed. And nearly 3,600 sites were recorded as unknown. There was no target known. And 8,238 were, the target was unidentified. 1,000 more, the target was recorded as a sampan, a small boat on a river. Now, the victims of these uh, attacks by US aircraft, in my, uh, estimate, uh, based on many interviews with Cambodian survivors of the bombing, which I conducted in Cambodia in 1980 and, uh, and 81, the number of victims was between 50,000, but probably more, uh, and 150,000, but probably closer to the latter figure. More importantly than even that was the Khmer Rouge grew from less than 10,000 in 1969, to more than 200,000 and growing in 1973 during the height of the bombing. The worst bombing took place in 1973. So, and then they took power in 1975 and subjected Cambodia to a rule in which uh, 1.7 million people were killed in the next four years. So perhaps it's not surprising that while the US bombed Iraq for eight years, from 2003 that we saw the rise of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, given the repeat exercise of US bombing in Iraq. In fact, it's the most extreme factions like the Khmer Rouge led by Pol Pot or Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS. These most extreme factions seem best able to thrive in conditions created by intense aerial bombardment. Thank mm. you. Thank you, Ben. And it seems to be a theme throughout what we've heard tonight, right, with U.S. involvement. When it comes to bombing, there are civilians that are targeted and in resulting radicalization of the populace. Um, you know, you're not going to love someone who's bombing your home, right? It's really not a good PR move. Um, 
among other things. And uh, thank you for sharing um, those stats about Cambodia. I wanted to now turn to Wit, my apologies again, um, to close with um, Vietnam. Thank you, Wit. Yeah, thank you for having me here today. And I'm very happy to uh, stand in for Professor Long. And, but I'm also very saddened by his uh, passing away. Um, he was my uh, PhD dissertation committee member. Um, and he was a dear mentor. Um, a very gentle soul, um, and I, I, I'm, I'm very sincere when I say that without his support, I uh, would not have been um, where I am today. He's, he was such a steadfast uh, source of support. He provided me a lot of. He provided me a lot of with a lot of guidance and without trying, you know, he, it was just the way he was. Um, so, yeah. Um, so with that in mind, I, I would like to um, say a few things about the, this book, you know, uh, it, I was, you know, when, when I study the, the Vietnam War, one question that I always asked was, could it have been different? You know, the amount of suffering, um, the amount of devastation uh, was staggering. And, you know, I, I was always wondering, so did it have to be that? Way? And this book provided some answers to that. And I would encourage people to read it because it, uh, you know, would give the readers some specific information about some specific aspects or locations or places or people in the war, but also would give us really good contextual um, information as well to situate the, the Vietnam War in a larger picture. The chapter that I, I felt, uh, was the two chapters that I, that I really particularly um, uh, uh, appreciate because it, it made me see, you gave me like information that I had not known before are the, the, are the chapters by um, Clinton Fernandez, uh, the Indonesian domino and then the chapter 11 by moving along. So um, as Mark mentioned earlier, um, the, the US had you know, uh, meddled in the Indonesian um, affairs for a long time. And if you read the chapter, you will see that you know, in the first phase of the, um, uh, the, the you know, I intervention in the late 1950s, it sounded like just like the, the Cuban affair, like the, the Bay of Pig kind of thing. Um, but, then, uh, but then the US learned this lesson. It decided, no, we're not gonna do that outright like that. We're gonna alienate a lot of, uh, um, of people in the military. Instead, we're gonna co-opt co the military in Indonesia and use them for our, um, for our purposes. And that's, that's, um, that's basically what the US uh, did. Um, and, uh, you know, switching from causing rebellion in the outer islands of uh, Indonesia to, um, the, you know, uh, splitting the, the Indonesian uh, army. And so that's when, uh, that's, it was part of the reason why uh, the massacres happened in um, in Indonesia and decimated the Communist Party in uh, Indonesia, and it changed um, the Indonesian um, politics um, forever. And so uh, the question that the author, the implication that the author uh, laid out here, uh, was very you know it, it was profound when it comes to uh, the war in Indochina. Uh, here's one you know after you know. The uh, author uh, explained um, the uh, uh, what's that here? Um, 
the destruction of the Communist Party in, in, in Indonesia um, and social and uh, revolutionary change in Indonesia and the US meddling there. Um, he uh, went on to say that, let me read you this. Um, Matt George Bundy, the US National Security Advisor for the Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, and one of the main architects of the Vietnam War, later said that the anti-communist purges in Indonesia had achieved the broader objective of preventing independent economic nationalism in the region. Then um, he also document uh, the uh, you know attitude of other um, leaders in in China I mean in uh, Southeast Asia that the, uh, they to those leader um, uh, the domino um, uh, theory was uh, they, they were no longer um, concerned about Vietnam after 1965. McNamara said in 1967, to the extent that, that our original intervention and our existing actions in Vietnam were motivated by the perceived need to draw the line against the Chinese expansionism in Asia, our objective has, been, uh, has already been attained. So in other words, the author said that the US should have terminated its war in Vietnam after the Indonesian uh, massacres because it was no longer necessary. Again, the question of you know, uh, what, we, what could have been done differently. So why, why did the US continue after 1965 um, uh, to cause such a destruction uh, in Indochina? Um, and the answer might come uh, from chapter 11 when um, Ngo Vinh Long explained, uh, let me just read you one short, um, uh, sentence here, you know, the uh, lifting the trade embargo uh, for Vietnam would in effect be rewarding the communists uh, for defeating the US and East South Vietnamese um, allies. And basically the US policy was just about punishing the Vietnamese, uh, whether, it, you know, the policy was um, strategically necessary or not. That's a wonderful quote to end with. And I think punishment and pride versus civilian lives are a question that's brought up again and again in this book um, throughout Southeast Asia, which is so frustrating, but also why we're here still talking about it, working towards reconciliation. That brings us to our first question from an audience member. It's a question for Mark from Titus Peachy. I'm curious if Mark has any thoughts about what an apology or truth and reconciliation work might look like between the United States and Laos. The U.S. has greatly increased its support for bomb clearance over the years. What else should be happening? Well, I believe you're on mute, Mark. Uh, there are better people than me to ask this question, and I'm sure you know the names of some of the organizations that are already working on these questions. Uh, uh, but uh, one somewhat analogous situation that I think is noteworthy. So uh, what about, so I talked about Germany earlier. What about France and its colonial legacy? Um, President Macron, for multiple reasons, some of them definitely good, wants to achieve better relations with Algeria, which as I think you probably all know, had to struggle for its independence uh, in a bitter war against then colonial France that cost upwards of a million lives. But he is, uh, Macron and Algeria are making progress towards this goal. And a crucial part of their negotiations concerns historical records. They're both, both parties are talking about opening their archives so that you know, to dispel the mythologies on both sides of, you know, uh, I mean, I don't have to go into it, but of, of course, honest history is, is like a disinfectant against myth and rumor and uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, malevolent thinking. So uh, there's, I mean, if, if uh, France and Algeria can do it, why can't the US do it for Laos? Uh, it, it should be easier, frankly. I mean, we probably have better record keeping. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, again, there are multiple groups working on questions like this, and I'm not an authority of any kind, but that's one example I, I read about recently and I think is really noteworthy. So I know it's a question we can all continue to think about um, as we honor this history and look at a way forward. We have time for one last question. It's from Alina. I've noticed that the region of Southeast Asia, specifically Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia has been referred to as Indochina by many Western historians, including featured works in this book. Today, many Southeast Asian communities find the term Indochina to be incorrect and insensitive in describing the region given the context of its colonial origins. Why is it still being used? And why is it still acceptable in academia when it's not generally used today when discussing the countries themselves? And that's open for anyone to answer. May I say something? Of course. I, I, I don't have an answer to this. And I agree that it's, it's, it's tied to the colonial past and it could be insensitive and, and yeah, uh, triggering. What, what should be the alternative though for the three countries, Laos, Vietnam and Cambodia? Mm. If we're not gonna use it, then what should we use to, you know, instead of saying all three countries at once? A great point. Uh, could I say something here? Of course. Um, when I was a graduate student, I ordered a book that was called The Conquest of Indochina. And uh, when the book arrived in the mail, it turned out to be all about Burma. <laughs> the, word, the word Indochina in uh, early European studies uh, referred to mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. That is Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, so when the French conquered part of that region, it became, that part became French Indochina. And then when the French left, the French word disappeared, the word French disappeared, and that just became Indochina. So the word has gone through a number of different uh, forms, and uh, it, it is ahistorical in that sense, uh, and, and uh, conventions change. Uh, many Burmese would be quite upset to find that the word Indochina was once used to refer in part to Burma. Uh, but uh, there's, uh, there's no reason why uh, the word Indochina, at least in the French colonial period, uh, should, uh, should disappear from history uh, because that was the title of the colonial empire that the French established there. Uh, and of course, Indochina had no political significance as a term after 1954. Laos, Vietnam, both North and South and uh, Cambodia were independent countries. Uh, but, uh, you know, newspapers still tended to use the term. Uh, they appointed Indochina correspondents to cover all three countries. Uh, partly because they might have spoken French and French was used in, uh, in many of those countries still uh, by the generation that grew up under French rule. So there, there are conventions that might not have much sense today, but they uh, do have a historical argument in their favor. Uh, there's some reason to uh, argue that we shouldn't use the term Indochina to refer to the countries of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia today, In just order. like we shouldn't use it for Burma today. Mm. Those are great points about the historical context of the term and the way we can refer to modern day states. I know Mark had one comment about an upcoming event he wanted to share with us before we close, but before we turn it over to Mark, I wanted to quickly say uh, the United States, Southeast Asia and Historical Memory from Haymarket Books, it's available anywhere books are sold, or if you'd like to make a donation to Legacies of War, uh, $50 will send you the book in the mail free of charge. So you can learn more about everything you've um, heard tonight and dig a little deeper. And with that, over to Mark. I am doing uh, volunteer work with 
a group called the Viet Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. And on November 20th, I, and I hope you can see the website out there, uh, there will be a, a 50th anniversary of an important event. What was an important event in the history of the anti-war movement? Uh, three very, four distinguished people are going to look back and reflect on uh, an event in 1972 where they came to Washington and uh, both demonstrated and discussed uh, what is the appropriate response of a citizen to uh, a, gov their gov a government that commits war crimes. So the title of the event is Citizens' Responsibility for Confronting and Remembering the Crimes of War. And the people on November 20th that will be discussing this are very distinguished uh, Carolyn Eisenberg, a historian at Hofstra, who has an enormous book coming out on Kissinger and Nixon and uh, the Vietnam War from Oxford in the near future. Robert J. Lifton, uh, one of the one of the three three original participants in the 1972 event. He's a professor of psychiatry at uh, Columbia University. Wrote extensively on psychological aspects of the, the Indochina War. Cora Weiss, uh, past president of the International Peace Bureau and co-founder of the Committee of Li Liaison with families of servicemen detained in North Vietnam. And then Richard Falk, who we've already mentioned. So I, I strongly encourage people to listen in to that event on November 20th. That's great. Thank you, Mark. And with that, that concludes our discussion of the book tonight, United States, Southeast Asia and Historical Memory. Again, anywhere books are sold. Uh, you can also donate to Legacies of War for $50 and we'll send the book your way. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience and thank you to our sponsors, the Sigur Center um, and the Partnerships for International Strategies in Asia and lastly, Legacies of War. Um, enjoy your evening, everyone. Thank you.